Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this session of the FT's Global Banking Summit. I'm Imani Moiz, U.S. Banking Correspondent, and I'm thrilled to be, interview to be sitting down with Al Kelly, CEO of Visa. How are you, Al? Imani, it's great to be with you. I'm doing very well. Thank you. So we're talking about a very exciting topic, the future of money, which can go in so many different directions. But I thought maybe it'd be good to start with explaining or telling a little bit about how we got here, right? Like a few years ago, uh, 10 years ago, you'd have to leave the house to uh, make a payment, but now I could buy coffee with my face. So, and Visa's been kind of on the back end fueling a lot of those innovations. So what's that been like? Well, it's very exciting. You know, the future of money, I think in a word is digital. And uh, in many ways, digital started, you know, decades ago with the first debit card and then subsequently uh, prepaid cards and, uh, and credit cards. But Clearly, e-commerce has been the accelerant of uh, the digital world. And oddly enough, the pandemic has been an accelerant further of e-commerce. Millions of people for the first time, uh, because they found themselves stuck at home and had to sign on online and learn how to shop and buy goods and, and food, et cetera, online. And, and they never did that before. And I think that trend is very sustaining and, uh, and very, very uh, sticky. You know, I'll share a little bit of data to give a sense of this. You know, we um, at uh, Visa, people can use their debit cards for both getting cash and buying goods and services. And historically, those two numbers would be very close, but in the last year, uh, using use of debit cards to get cash was up 4%, but use of debit cards to buy goods and services was up 23%. And if you look at it over a little bit longer period of time, uh, if you go back three years and compare that to 2021, actually the number of cash transactions using debit cards is down. And in that same period from 18 to 21, we've seen an increase of 54 billion transactions in, in payment volume. The other accelerants have been the fact that the, the reach has just grown. You know, Visa has 3.7 billion credentials around the world enabling people to buy. And on the other side, our acceptance footprint now is about 100 million merchant locations. So it's uh, incredible reach. And what we really do every day is allow those 3.7 billion transactions to be used at those 100 million merchant locations. Beyond that, there's other things that are accelerating the, the digital world. The, fact that there's different types of money movement. People are paying each other uh, P2P. Uh, you are seeing uh, use cases such as open networks in transit. So we're working with over 400 transit uh, uh, agencies around the world where they're enabling people to use their uh, debit cards or credit cards to just tap, which tapping is another thing that's been an accelerant in the face-to-face -face world. It's just so much easier to tap. Card never leave, needs to leave your hands. And again, in a world that is now worried about safety from the pandemic, the fact that the card stays in your hands. And last year, 70% of the face-to-face -face transactions around the world were tapped to pay. Five years ago, it would have been close to zero or, or, or a single digit. And then you're seeing use cases like the ability to pay gig economy workers. So we enable companies like Uber and Lyft at the end of the shift, their drivers can automatically uh, ask for payment uh, for what they've earned in that particular day to get sent directly to their uh, bank account or their debit card, and that's enabled by uh, uh, Visa Rails. So I look ahead, Amani, and I say that uh, the, the future of, of money is digital. Cash will still be around, but I think the use cases associated with cash will increasingly decrease uh, uh, over time. Yeah, I think it's, it's so interesting uh, seeing this acceleration of digital payments, but at the same time, it's so hard to imagine a world without cash. So you, you talked about the, you see fewer use cases, but what role do you think cash plays kind of in the future of money? Well, first of all, I mean, cash is, is playing a role for a lot of the unbanked people around the world who are out of the, the, the financial uh, mainstream. But, but beyond that, there are still use cases that w where we're going to have to uh, make some, have some innovation in order for cash to ever be displaced. You know, tipping is a, 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 a big example of, of, a, of a use case. I also think that for, uh, for some people buying 
you know, a, a simple cup of coffee seems easier to in, still for some people to pay in cash, although increasingly people are, are tapping and, 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 and big uh, companies are getting behind trying to push digital in those environments as well. So I think that uh, we, we, by our estimates, those last year still was $18 trillion spent on cash and checks around the world. So it's not going anywhere uh, uh, quickly. And I think as people get, as we get more people into the financial mainstream, and as the technology and the user experience gets better, I st think you'll start to see cash still continue to decline. But it, I, I can't imagine a, a future where there isn't uh, some cash still utilized. Yeah, you touched on a really important point where cash is still so important to the unbanked and people who have been traditionally left out of the financial system. So as we move towards this digital future, how can we make digital payments more inclusive? It's a very important question. Uh, you know, what are there, a little less than 8 billion people on the face of the earth? And uh, probably many of the people attending this conference don't fall into this category, but about 1.7 billion are outside the financial mainstream, meaning that they either are completely illiterate as it relates to financial matters, or they're not being offered the ability to uh, uh, bank, get banked and have debit cards or, or credit cards or uh, prepaid cards. We're, we think it's important and exciting to try to close that gap. We made a commitment back in 2015 to enable half a billion people over five years and get them into the financial mainstream. And we met that goal about nine months short of the five-year mark. More recently, we made a commitment to uh, digitize 50 million businesses around the world and we're in three-year period and we're on pace uh, to, in fact, uh, make that happen. I think part of the job is we have to work on providing financial literacy education, which we do do in, in many countries around the world and in, in multiple languages. And we have to work with our financial institution partners to create products that allow these folks to start to get into the financial mainstream. The other thing that's very important on this subject, Armani, is some public policy work that's very, very important where governments play a role. Um, and the first place there is broadband internet access. You know, broadband is a, an incredible enabler in terms of being able to both buy or sell g goods and services. And if, if you don't have access to the internet, you are really, it's almost becoming like a, any other Im important utility type of thing like water and electricity, et cetera, that it, it, it's gonna leave you behind if you don't have broadband access. Uh, today, we're, we're, we're talking about even big cities where there's uh, areas that, uh, and groups of people that don't have access. And then obviously, there's lo many emerging markets that, that don't. So it's very important. And for instance, in the recent infrastructure bill that the President of the United States signed uh, earlier this week, uh, the reality was that uh, there was a number of uh, fun, a group of funds in there for increasing broadband access. So we need that to happen around the world. A second public policy element is data flows. Data needs to flow easily uh, and, and be accepted uh, in terms of its payment flow around the, uh, around its flow around the world. Uh, data can be very powerful in terms of enabling uh, banks and financial institutions to have the information they need in order to, to uh, bank people. And things like onshoring and data localization are, in my opinion, bad public policy and hold people back. And then obviously there needs to be interoperability. There needs to be an adoption of standards that are the same from country to country to allow the, f the flow of funds cross-border, which is increasingly being I important. And hopefully as, as people start to get back on the road and travel from one country to another post-pandemic, obviously uh, being able to trust that you can use your Visa card from Malaysia when you go to Australia is obviously very, very important. So we're very committed and, and very much focused on trying to get more people uh, included in the, in the mainstream uh, financial and, and banking systems around the world. Well, yeah, circling back to just some of the innovations that we've seen in terms of tap to pay or account to account, um, like broadly speaking, like as consumers, retailers, and other businesses have more options to pay, how are, like how does your relationship with them as Visa need to change? 
So when we think about payments or, or money movement, there are the, the products that, in, in that allow you to pay, and then there is the connective tissue that makes it happen. We're really in the second business at, at Visa, where we are the enabler for multiple and increasingly uh, larger numbers of, of ways you, you can pay, both, uh, both in the physical face-to-face -face world as well as uh, the online world. And our job is to not pick winners and losers. Uh, we, don't, we try to lean into every new technology, no matter where it's come from, any new payment option or money movement option, no matter where it comes from, because we think ultimately it's the consumer, based on value and the user experience, who should be the ones selecting the, who the winners and losers are based on what they vote with by their actions every time they have a choice of how they pay uh, whether it's online or it's uh, it's face to face, so what we're focused on uh, first of all is ubiquity. I want people to think of Visa like they think about air. That when they leave their home, if they have a Visa card in their purse or their wallet, they have no worries. They're going to be able to use it anywhere they uh, they want to use it. Uh, I'm very concerned about reliability, making sure that when you do use your card, it's going to work and it's going to work every single time, even in busy times. We had, these have spent $9 billion on technology in the last f five years. We can process 65,000 transactions per second. Um, and uh, we continue to invest in our technology to make sure that it is reliable no matter what payment form you use. We're also focused on security, obviously. And that takes into account data privacy. It takes into account cyber uh, uh, protections. And then lastly, we want you or any consumer to feel confident anytime you use a Visa card. And so, for instance, there's a zero liability for a uh, fraud for a, a consumer. Any merchant, big or small around the world, knows they can count on Visa to pay them uh, that, that day. And so that, that confidence helps as well. So that, that's our job. We're that connective tissue. We're happy to see an increasing number of ways for people to pay. That's good for everybody. And we're going to do everything we can to enable all of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is within the same vein, but as you're, you're starting to see fragmentation in the global payment space, if it's whether it's real-time payments or um, other open banking, pla other op open open banking systems. Um, as you're navigating this space and Visa's navigating the space, how do you identify a potential partner from a potential threat or a competitor? Very good question. I have a very simple philosophy on this: that everybody is a potential partner, and uh, we try to engage with everybody who's involved in payments or money movement. And I think that given our experience and our, our innovation, our tools, our capabilities, that we, we often end up being a, a very, very good partner. And only until some point in time where somebody uh, has made it very clear to us that they don't want to work with us and they want to be, in fact, a threat to us, then obviously uh, we, we take that seriously too. But I, I don't sit back and say, anytime I hear about something for the first time, well, that that feels like a threat. I immediately have a reaction as that feels like an opportunity. Let's go talk to those those folks. You know, four four years ago, wallets started to proliferate around the world, and a lot of people said, "Boy, this is going to be really bad for Visa. The, they're they're going to do their own thing. They're going to create their own closed network." And what's happened over those last four years is all of those closed networks have opened. Uh, and they've opened because they realize that running a network is expensive and running a closed network has limitations in terms of your ability to grow and scale it over time. So what, what happened in that period? Most of those closed networks came to Visa, we did deals with them, and they now accepted Visa cards or allowed their consumer customers to accept Visa cards in their wallets, which gave them the immediate utility of Visa around the world where they could shop at any one of the hundred million locations that Visa has as opposed to being limited to a much, much smaller universe of acceptance points in this closed network. So I, you know, increasingly we're talking to the buy now, pay later players about 
how where in essence they are somewhat of a, a closed network, and we believe that they can do better and have more optionality and more relevance for their customers by opening up and creating products that actually have the I embedded within them, their Visa products, they have the, the embedded within them the buy now, pay later capability. And again, if they're, have a, if they're on the Visa network, they're gonna grow their scale ma massively overnight versus having to go merchant by merchant by merchant. So uh, again, I, I'm, I'm a believer that uh, we've been in this business for a long time. Uh, we have an incredible brand, incredible reach, uh, and incredible capabilities. And we think that we can help virtually anybody be more successful by partnering with us than working, uh, not partnering with us. And that's our aim, is to partner with as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. Has there been any examples where you looked at um, an emerging technology or uh, just another company and you said, well, maybe this is more of a threat than a partner? I, 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 no, I, not that I can th uh, think of. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, again, our philosophy is to lean in. You know, it, it, in the most recent time, crypto is an example where we've leaned into crypto in a big way. Uh, I think there's people out there who would say, oh, man, crypto could be uh, a, th a threat to Visa. Well, so far, you know, we're spending a tremendous amount of time building capability, building uh, relationships and building uh, partnerships. J just two weeks ago, I did two sessions with CEOs of most of the big crypto companies around the world. I did two sessions, one in the early morning and one in the, at night to cover the, uh, the various time zones around the world. And, and I think that uh, all of those partners that, uh, and some of them are yet to be partners, but all of the participants, I think, understood uh, that Visa is there to try to help them be successful. And so, uh, you know, crypto is a good example, a good recent example of something where we now have forged partnership with 60 of the crypto players around the world, many of whom are already allowing Visa cards in their clients' wallets to facilitate the uh, exchange of the cryptocurrency for fiat to allow them to shop at all of Visa's uh, merchants around the world. Yeah, it's certainly hard to talk about the future of money or think about the future of money without mentioning crypto. Um, so I'm just curious for your personal perspective and what do you think is the viability of cryptocurrency as a medium of exchange? Well, I think in answering that question, we have to break crypto into three categories. One is what I would call digital gold, which is more the, the, the bouncy asset like Bitcoin, uh, which is not tied to a, a fiat currency. Then I think there's uh, cryptocurrencies that are kind of stable coins, uh, meaning they're tied to a specific fiat currency and they're therefore more predictable. And then the third ca emerging category is central bank digital currencies. So we're doing a number of things in the crypto space. First of all, our bread and butter is just facilitating the purchase of them. Uh, and many, many people around the world, millions of people in the last couple of years have been buying uh, Bitcoin. Uh, I don't see Bitcoin as a, a vehicle that's going to work very well in, in the payment space, but it's a very interesting asset that people want to own in their portfolio. Even if their portfolio is small, you know, most of the, the millions of purchases being made of Bitcoin are actually small amounts because I think people want to play around with it. They want to understand it, that it feels cool to, to uh, own it. The second thing we're doing, I started to mention, which is we're working with crypto players to create utility for their crypto wallets by allowing them to have a Visa card in the wallet that it facilitates the exchange of crypto to fiat or fiat to crypto. But when it goes from crypto to fiat, it allows those cards to be used at any Visa location. We're creating APIs to help medium and small banks offer crypto uh, capabilities to their customers. So in the United States, we're working with Anchorage Bank, uh, the first federally chartered digital asset bank, where they will uh, al allow people to buy, sell, and custody uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. And our app is, can be made available to any one of these banks to facilitate those banks being able to offer that capability to, uh, to their customers. We're building the settlement capability for our our, our system to settle in cryptocurrencies in the at evening when we settle in 29 other currencies around 
uh, the world. And lastly, we're working very closely with central uh, banks to understand what their plans are and to certainly encourage them into a public-private partnership for us with regard to, uh, to cryptocurrencies. So again, I'm not in the predicting game. I, I don't know how successful crypto will be downstream, but I'm assuming, and by leaning into it, I'm assuming it's going to be quite successful, and, uh, or at least the stablecoin elements are. And uh, we want to be there from the early days and, uh, and help those partners be successful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just thinking about crypto as yet another uh, kind of payment option um, in terms of like the fragmentation that we're seeing in this space. Um, so how are you, when you're working with, again, retailers or, or other types of merchants, have you had to change or tweak your value to proposition given all the, the developments in the payment space? No, I mean, we, const we constantly have to advance our technology. But remember, the, the real core payment uh, element uh, or vehicle is, is created by the financial institution or the crypto player. You know, again, we're that, we're that network, we're that enabler that allows those different products to flow from one customer to one merchant or flow cross uh, border. So uh, yes, we have to tweak our technology when there's a new, uh, sometimes when there's a new product out there to facilitate its, its ability to run on our network, but it, that's not a big chore for us. It's something we're used to doing all the time. Okay, and I guess speaking of competition as we were earlier, um, one of the trends that we're starting to see is, um, although Visa and MasterCard have definitely dominated global payments and global payment networks, um, around the entire world, you're starting to see these domestic network, the domestic payment networks be, uh, pop up in places like Australia, India, um, et cetera. I was just wondering if you think, although I think it's something like 4% of global payments still, um, do you think that's a trend that's going to pick up steam or how is that changing the way you're thinking about uh, your own growth? Well, it's existed for some time um, in, in certain places. Um, it's hard to build a network. Uh, it costs tons and tons of money. It takes years. I mean, to th th Visa's been in business now uh, for 63 years, and we're still growing. And it, it takes a long time to build a network with 3.7 billion buyers on one side and 100 million sellers on the other side. We have 10 uh, million miles of fiber optic around the world that facilitates the telecommunications. Uh, to get to the point where we could process the number of uh, uh, transactions that we can per second re requires hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. To protect the system in terms of cybersecurity is very, very expensive. So the, the reality is that, yes, these local schemes, will I think, will continue in certain places. They tend to be domestic. And where it's an even playing field, which is all we ask for. I mean, competition is competition. We all have that to compete. We just want to make sure it's uh, an even, even playing field. And if it is, then we feel very confident about our uh, ability to uh, compete quite effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a good place to end is for so many people, con consumers especially, which I think we all are, right, <laughs> at the end of the day. Absolutely. Um, Visa is synonymous with the card, right, with, with the plastic that we have in our wallet. Um, just as plastic becomes a little bit less relevant, um, how do you plan to keep the Visa brand relevant and top of mind? Very good question and, and something we think about all the time. You know, it's, it's very important to us that you, in its digital form, you can see the Visa card. So whether it's at the, uh, whether you are using a uh, mobile phone and you've got the card stored in your wallet, if you look, you'll, you'll see Visa. Uh, we're working hard to make sure that at uh, checkout, in uh, any online experience that you'll be able to see the Visa card. And there's a whole bunch of things we're doing in terms of uh, tools behind the scenes where I think you'll start to see more uh, things like powered by Visa, enabled by Visa, and those kinds of things. So uh, it's, uh, it's very important to us that we keep our, our brand uh, visible and on the minds of consumers. That brand stands for uh, trust people know that when they see the Visa card that they can trust that they can use it, that it will be secure. And so making sure that consumers know that that is the same 
exact promise and commitment from Visa in the digital world that it, it, that it is in the face-to-face -face world is something we're maniacally focused on. All right, well, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Fascinating topic. I think the, the pace of innovation and change in the payment space um, is only going to um, accelerate from here. So thank you so much it's, for the time. Yeah, it's very exciting space, and I'm, I'm, it's been my pleasure to be with you, Armani. Thank you. And to those of you following along, thank you so much for tuning into this session, and I hope you stay tuned for the next one.